In this video, I'm going to talk about the advantages of using live data with respect to the architectural design pattern known as MVVM. So first of all, why was MVVM and live data created? Android already had so many concepts to know about, why further complicate things with different architectures and design patterns? When Android was first introduced, developers would add all of their code to a single activity, or almost all of it to a single activity. Think of this as a god class that contained literally everything. There's business logic, there's views, and there's any other code required to make the activity function properly. There's several problems with building activities that way. Number one is they're extremely complex and they're difficult to read and modify. Number two is they contain all kinds of interdependencies that can cause issues. So if one thing breaks, likely many other things will also break. Number three is dealing with lifecycle events is a pain because there's so many variables that you need to account for. Number four is they are very difficult to unit test. Because of these issues, developers started coming up with their own solutions to the problems. They started coming up with their own architectures, things like MVC, MVVM, MVP, and probably many others. Developers coming up with unique solutions is not a problem, but there is a problem when it becomes sort of a free-for-all. Because in that situation, nobody really knows what the best practice way is. Everybody's just kind of coming up with their own solutions. So if you went to work at one place, they might use some other random architecture. If you went to work at another one, they would use some other random architecture. There'd be no defined best practice way to do things. That's why Google came up with the Android Architecture Components Library. Live data and view models is part of that library. Consider this example. I think this is a really great way to conceptualize the live data and the view model concept. So instead of the activity being the center of the universe, think of live data as being the center of the universe. The view model contains all of the business logic and you can have any number of observers listening for changes to the live data. The observers are in the activities. If you don't know what I mean by business logic, I mean literally anything related to the code logic, if statements, loops, queries to the database, switch statements, all that stuff. Personally, a good rule of thumb that I like to use is I like to try and keep all of the if statements and any of the code logic like switch statements and loops and things like that out of the observers. So I only put them into the view models. Now this is just a rule of thumb. Obviously there's gonna be different cases and sometimes you're gonna to need to put if statements in your activities. But this is just what I, I like to try and do, like a game I like to play with myself. How can I keep all of the logic, all of the business logic away from the views, anything to do with the views? I know that can't always be done, but that's generally just my goal. Also, an important thing to note when you're looking at a diagram like this is live data will only ever update observers that are active. And that might not have been obvious to you, so I just wanted to make sure that was clear. So if you have multiple views listening to some source of live data, you don't have to worry about null pointers or things like that because the, uh, the live data will only update active observers. Carrying on from the example that we just talked about with live data at the middle, at the center of the universe, this is kind of a better architecture model from what we were looking at before. So I've added live data to each of these sections. So the view model is going to be updating observers in the activity. The view model is going to be getting its live data from the repository. And then the repository is getting its live data from either the remote data source, which is the REST API, or the database cache in the case that the REST API is not functioning properly. So it's kind of like this train of live data that's getting fed into the activity that, uh, that has the observer. Keep in mind though, if you refer back to the diagram that I mentioned earlier, you can have any number of observers viewing the live data. So in this case, in this example from the diagram I have in front of me, there's four observers. But in the application that we're building, there's only going to be a single observer and that's going to be in that single activity. But keep in mind, you could have multiple observers. Just in the example of the course that I'm making, there's going to be a single observer. Now that you know a little bit more about live data and how I'm going to be using it in this project, here are six reasons why you should use live data in this project and also in your other projects. Uh, I'm sure most of you know that I think personally MVVM is the best way to structure your code, the best architecture that exists in Android today. So here are six practical reasons why I think that. Number one is live data ensures your UI matches your data state. Live data follows the observer pattern. Live data notifies observer objects when the lifecycle state changes. 
you can consolidate your code to update the UI in these observer objects. If you didn't have these observers observing the live data, you would have to update the UI every single time that your app data changes. So every time a new query is made, every time the data changes from the service, from the database cache, and you have to call methods and methods can very quickly become entangled with other methods and it can get very ugly very quickly. So overall, it, live data and MVVM leads to a much cleaner code structure. Number two is you probably won't get memory leaks, or I guess you're, you're much less likely to get memory leaks. Observers are bound to lifecycle objects, and those objects are cleaned up after their associated lifecycle is destroyed. So if you remember that diagram that we looked at just a minute ago with the live data at the center of the universe, I'll just bring it up here. All of these observers subscribe to a live data object. If those observers die, or in other words, if an activity is destroyed or it's no longer observing the live data, the live data no longer sends that data back to the observer. So you have no issues there uh, with memory leaks. Number three is there will be no crashes due to stopped activities. So this is sort of similar to the, the point that I just mentioned, but a little bit different. So if the observer's life cycle is inactive, like in a case when an activity is in a backstack or a fragment is in a backstack, it hasn't been destroyed, but it's, it's, um, it's in that unpaused state, it's not going to receive any life cycle event callbacks from, from the observer. So the observer will stop receiving updates from the live data. So you're not going to get any issues related to that. Number four is there's no more manual life cycle handling. So what do I mean by that? UI components just observe relevant data and don't stop or resume their observation. So live data automatically manages all of this since it's aware of the relevant lifecycle status changes while it's observing. Number five, which is probably one of my favorites, probably my second favorite, is your data is always up to date. So what happens if a lifecycle becomes inactive? For example, an activity that was in the background receives the latest data right after it returns from the, to the foreground. It would receive the latest data upon becoming active again. So you don't have to worry about you know, calling certain methods to get that new data to make sure that data is updated. You basically, it's sort of like you always have a listener listening for that updated data. And that's the advantages of using an observer. When, as soon as that data is available, as soon as that, that life cycle becomes active again, or sorry, not as soon as the data is available, it's as soon as the life cycle becomes active again, that data is updated from the source, from that live data source. Number six is my favorite one. This has to do with configuration changes. If you have been around Android development for any amount of time, I'm sure you've run into issues with configuration changes. You switch the orientation, the activity is destroyed, recreated, and suddenly your app crashes, or the data is not right, something is wrong. Something always happens on configuration changes, there's always issues. So the advantages of using MVVM is if an activity or a fragment is recreated due to a configuration change, like a de device rotation, like I just said, it immediately receives the latest available data. So that data is saved in the view model. And as soon as that, that activity is recreated or rebuilt or that fragment is, that same data gets updated to the UI which is a really, really beautiful thing. It prevents so many problems, so many crashes, and you don't have to worry about making another network request, another request to your database cache. It's really just a beautiful thing. So using live data with the model view view model architecture, also known as MVVM, is my favorite way to structure code. I know I've said that a couple times in a couple of my videos. It's my favorite for all of the reasons that I just listed. If you've never heard of MVVM or live data, you're probably still not completely sold on it, and I get it. It's a very different way to look at, uh, at structuring your code. It's also very confusing. There's, you know, there's live data, there's mutable live data, there's mediator live data. What are all these things? How do they work? It's, uh, it's another thing you gotta learn. And at the end of the day, uh, when you gotta learn something new, it's always painful, there's always struggles. So I get it if, you, if you're not sold on it. So anyway, if you do wanna take the next step in learning MVVM, I have a couple of resources for you. So number one is a free getting started video on MVVM. It's on YouTube, I have a blog post on it on my website also. It basically just shows you how to get started with MVVM and it walks you through a very simple, practical example. There's a link to that in the description of this video. And number two is a course on my website. That's actually why I'm filming this video to begin with. It's for a course on my website. In the course, I build an app that interacts with a REST API web service. 
the entire app is built using MVVM. So you get a very great, an overall good, great picture of how to use MVVM in a very practical way. Obviously, I recommend number two, which is taking the course on my website, but it is a paid course, so I understand if you don't want to pay, but it's definitely worth, worth it. You're going to learn how to interact with a REST API. You'll learn how to use MVVM. Uh, you'll become very good at MVVM, I would say, actually, by the end of it, how to properly use MVVM too, like use all of the architecture. So if I pull up like a diagram, you'll have your view model, your repository, your remote data source, your models. You'll learn how to use retrofit. Uh, lots, lots of really valuable skills in that course.